Hi, today I want to kind of go off the usual type topic and talk about something very different. And that's, uh, we've often mentioned, or I've often talked about the wood, the barrel, the oak, the, the American oak, the French oak, the whatever. But being oak aged or barrel aged, we have never really talked about the barrels that much. So let's just kind of get into that subject for a bit. So, you know, what is a barrel and how does it affect wine? That's what we're going to talk about. So let's uh, just real brief old history. Um, I'm sure you've all seen the things that they dredge up off the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea with all these like clay jug thingies and um, that, uh, you know, they open up and, oh, it actually has wine in it, you know, from 2000 BC or something like that. Well, back in the old, old days, of course, winemaking has been around for a long, long time. I mean, you know, you can read about it in the Bible, you can read about it in any old mythology. They talk about the wine, so, you know, it's been around for a while. But uh, way back in those times, uh, the way they transported it, I mean, if you, you know, crushed the grapes on your, you know, pulled them off your own vineyard and crushed them and made wine and drank it right there, you are fine. You didn't have to worry about transport or storage or anything. But if uh, you wanted to make a lot of wine, you had excess, you wanted to sell it in the market or give it to someone or whatever, you had to get it from your place to their place, whichever place that may be. So how did you do it? Well, they started putting it in these uh, clay or pottery amphora. I think that's what it's pronounced. And, uh, you know, that was a way to carry it. They put olive oil in it. They put a lot of stuff in those things. And they just kind of like say, okay, well, we'll dump the wine in there and cart it away. The problem with that is several problems. First of all, the pots, or uh, M4, tend to be porous. So you get a lot more air into it, even if you seal the top up really tight with a cork of some fashion and seal it with wax or um, pitch or whatever. But uh, the, the clay itself was porous, so it would still get oxidated and, or oxidized and over time would become undrinkable. So, you know, fast forward a bunch of years, a lot of years, you know, a millennium or two, and uh, he came up with these guys and figured out if they uh, took these wooden slats and put them together in this way and put iron rings around them and tapped everything on tight, they had this thing that we came to know as a barrel, and it was really good for hauling stuff around in, kind of like the M4A, but they didn't break as well easily. I mean, you take a clay pot and you smack it with a hammer or something, you've got a bunch of pieces. You know, pot shards, they have a reason they called us, came up with that name. There's a lot of them around. So anyway, they found out by, you know, putting in, making these barrels out of wood that they were sturdier, they would hold more, well, not necessarily hold more, but hold it more securely. Okay, so eventually, of course, it got to the point where, oh, let's dump our wine in there and see if we can get that across the mountainside to the other town over there and sell it. So they did, and they did. And uh, over time, they kind of discovered that, hey, you know, putting these barrels actually makes it taste better when it gets there than it did when it left. I wonder why that is. So, yeah, years go by, experimentation, and uh, again, fast forward, so... Here we are, 21st century, and um, we're well familiar with barrels, and we know they're used in wine, so what actually happens with that? Okay, so first of all, just so you know, the guy or gal that makes the barrel, that is referred to, that person or profession is referred to a cooper. So if you hear something about cooperage, well, it's the kind of the act or process of making barrels. So, and that is, of course, done by cooper. All right, so here we are. We've got these wooden barrels, and in terms of wine, it was figured out over time that if you use oak for the wood, first of all, it's very sturdy. Oak is, I'm sure you've heard, a very, very hard wood, and it actually gives the best flavor to wine. I'm, they tried it with different types of wood, but oak seemed to be the one that worked the best for wine. Okay, so what happens? You get the big barrel, you put your wine in it, and cork it back up. Okay, is it airtight? Yeah, pretty much. And if you roll it around, you're going to get, like, see drops coming out. But the wood does breathe. So these real small amounts of air will go through the barrel and into the wine. So it's a very, very slow oxidation process. And that, of course, enhances the flavor of wine. It changes it. Now, it's not like putting in a glass and leaving it set out for a couple of years where it all evaporates away and what didn't evaporate just tastes like muck. So, again, very, very slow oxidation. You know, if you got it in a barrel for a year, you're going to lose a tiny bit to evaporation and you're going to get some air and oxygen through that wood in there, but not a lot. It's a very slow, slow process. And that slow down probably has a great deal of benefit to the wine. 
Okay, so that's kind of what happens in that respect, but the wood itself imparts some flavors. You're always hearing about the cinnamon, the vanilla, these types of things, and the tannins. That'll, not all of it, but a lot of that's coming from the barrel itself. So if you get a smokiness, well, that we'll get into that in a minute, but that comes from the toast on the barrel. Okay, so, well, we'll just go into it now. What is toast? All right, well, part of the barrel making process, well, if you're doing it traditionally, is you take, build like a little campfire, then you stand all these little slats up, the staves, stave, that's the actual name for these things, the slats, you put them over that, and if you ever try to bend a board, you know it's not that easy. It's like, you know, you can't just go like that, you know, and just bend it in a big arch. No, it's, it takes a lot of muscle to do that. Well, the same thing. If you notice, the barrels are not straight up and down. They've got that curve to them, kind of like an egg shape, only with the ends cut off. So, how do they do that? I mean, that would take a lot of force to do that. Well, come find out if you heat it up, like over a fire, it bends easier. So, that's what they do. They put these things up, stack them up vertically over the fire, kind of loosely hold them together, and then they start getting them, the edges all lined up like they should be all the way around, and they put the first ring down on it, and that uh, helps keep it in place. Or they probably do it the other way. I don't know. I've never made one, so I may have this backwards. But in essence, they start putting the rings on the top and the bottom, and then they bend them together with these rings, and you know, put in smaller and smaller rings to force it down together, and uh, the heat allows the wood to bend. So in the process of heating it up, you're actually charring it a bit. And that char, that little burn on the inside of the barrel, imparts flavor. That's referred to as the toast. So you can have a very light toast where you know, if you were to look at it, it might be slightly discolored, you know, a little tan or brownish to it, to a more heavy toast where it's definitely discolored from the fire or slightly burned. So those impart flavors. You know, more heavier toast give the wine a smokier taste, smokier aromas. Mm. But anyway. So that's part of the process. Now, the other aspect of that, so you know, you've got your barrels and you can make them different ways in uh, terms of how you, over the open fire. The other one is, you know, using a kiln and more mechanical means. So different processes um, to do that. So let's talk about the other big one, French versus American oak. Okay, so here's what we got here. You've got different types of oak trees. Just like you've got different types of apple trees, you know, you've got ones that grow Jonathan apples, and you've got ones that grow um, Granny Delicious, no, is it Granny Smith, or Red Delicious, gold, Yellow Golden Delicious, different apple trees. So similarly, you have different types of oak trees, and the type of oak that's used in France is different than the type of oak used in the U.S. So there you've got some differences in that context. The, if you were to look at the two of the staves side by side, a French and an American, you'd see that one, or magnified, you'd see one was a lot tighter grain, and the other one might be a little bit more open grain. So you got a little bit more, what well, looks like more space between the, the main, oh God, the grain bits. I don't know what you call those things, but it's a finer grain or coarser grain. So that's where some of the differences come in. Now, uh, if you're a um, winemaker ordering barrels, you could actually, and you're going to go with French oak, you would actually specify several things. You'd say, well, I want it from this forest here, not the other ones, because there's uh, different forests, and each specializes in their own barrels. So, you know, forest A, forest B, forest C. I can't remember their names. They're in French. So, anyway, you might say, well, I like forest B. It gives me the best result of my wine. So you order it from France, from forest B, and you say, okay, I want a light, medium, heavy toast on it, something of that sort, whichever one you want. So you customize it, then they ship it over to you, you pay them lots of money, and everybody's happy. So, again, that is a, it's a determined by the vintner, the winemaker. It's, he hit, or she decides that, yeah, this is the type of toast, this is the type of wood I want to use, all these little factors, and they feel that gives them the best product. Now, similarly, you can get order barrels from the U.S. They're made a little differently. They're kiln dried, whereas the French ones tend to be air dried, seasoned over a couple of years, just stacked up and let to dry naturally. The uh, American oak barrels tend to be kiln dried, so it's a faster process. And you can still order those with a toast on them, or whichever one you want, but they tend to come from mostly Missouri and maybe some other states, but you don't really order them based on, oh, I want this forest or that forest. So say, okay, I want some barrels. And the barrel makers, the coopers, 
put them together and ship them off to you. So, if you're uh, drinking the wine, you can get the better idea. So, if you know that it's um, a wine made in French oak versus a similar one made in American oak, taste those differences. Look for those differences. You know, just make sure you're drinking, uh, say, Cabernet Sauvignon in both, or you're drinking Merlot, or you're drinking whatever. It makes sure it's the same varietal. And get everything else as close together, close to the same as you can, and then compare the taste. So, you're going to have to kind of decide for yourself. Once you get used to it, and once you get a little more tasting under your belt, so to speak, you'll be able to differentiate and say, oh, this one is definitely American oak. This one over here is definitely French oak. And every once in a while, you'll get a combination. It might be half and half or 25-75. So it might get fermented in one and aged in the other. Or it might be that they'll do a batch of uh, wine all in American oak, another batch all in French oak, and then blend the two together. Something like that. That's actually fairly common. So you get some of the best characteristics of both types of barrels that way. Anyway, I hope that's been helpful to you. Um, yeah, barrels are very important in the winemaking industry. I'm not certainly not an expert on making them, but I've gotten pretty good at tasting them. So always wanting to taste more barrels and wine. So cheers. So Petit Verdot has its merits and it can enhance other wines, just like a tuba can enhance a full orchestra. So you think of an orchestral piece coming out. You might start out with something soft, you know, some little violins here. And then it kind of picks up with some percussion in the background. And then you get some other things coming in. And it kind of builds up and you've got this wonderful arc that's of music. You just, you know, all the way across or this way, whichever way works best for you. So it's the blending of all these instruments together that gives you the wonderful experience of a good concert. In the same sense, the proper blending of wine will give you that concert in your mouth. Yeah, how's that for an analogy?